There's a lot of talk about heroes these days. We think particularly of the essential workers, we think of health professionals, we think of uh, those uh, law enforcement, uh, safety, uh, we think of, I, I think of grocery store workers, I think of people coming here to, to drop off packages. I mean, I mean they're, they're a, most of us are staying safer at home, but there are still plenty of people out there that are, that are being exposed to a whole lot more individuals, human beings, potentially affected human beings, than the rest of us. Again, all those essential workers that I mentioned, I, you know, at, at a time like this, I think we all think, while all the essential workers are, are hugely appreciated, we, you know, I think of medical workers, right? They, 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 they go to work for 8 to 10 to 12-hour shift, and, and they take care of, of very sick patients, uh, who are highly contagious with a disease that we don't yet have a cure for. And, and, and they do this day in and day out, week after week. Th there are other heroes in all of this. I read a story about a woman and her husband and their young daughter. They're, they're taking care of 54 children at, at a, some sort of a facility in Nepal. Uh, who, uh, 54 children who needed a place to go who needed a place to stay. I, I think of the Orange County man that I read about who, who's cooking literally 5,000 pounds of pasta every single week and giving it away to needy people. I mean, these are heroes. These are our heroes right now. And if you are one of those people, thank you. Thank you for going to work. Thank you for stocking the shelves. Thank you for taking care of sick people. Thank you for finding ways for you to serve and support others. And thank God, of course, right, for, for providing so many wonderful people and, and, and courageous people and kind-hearted people and sacrificial people and, and selfless people. And that, that really is, is what a hero is. It's someone who puts, other, someone, or puts others before self. It's someone who is kind-hearted and, and, and caring and compassionate. A, a hero is someone who, who, is, uh, who, who does courageous things. A hero is someone who's willing to make a sacrifice. And, and, and that is a big concept. That is a big deal to make a sacrifice. Why, why do people do that? What motivates a person to make a sacrifice? There are any number of reasons I suppose we could cite. Um, on the one hand, on the positive side, I would say it's love and concern and care for others. That's why people make sacrifices in life. At the same time, I, I would say that not every sacrifice or not every kind act or kind act, excuse me, is equal. Not every kind act is the same. There are those who, who do things, who make sacrifices out of love and, and care and concern for other people, but then there are also those people who do things that look like sacrifices, but I'm not sure they really are because deep down inside they're asking themselves the question, whether consciously or, or just this is uh, subconsciously, this is their attitude. They're, they're, they're wondering, thinking to themselves, you know, really, what's in it for me? And that's, that's not the attitude, really, that, that God tells us to have, right? God, well, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 9, verse 7, it says there that God loves a cheerful giver. So, and we're going to talk about this more today and look at other passages where God in his word tells us to, to take what he's given to us as uniquely, divinely created human beings and, and use what we've been given to serve others. And, and so not only to give, but he wants us to give with the right frame of mind. He wants us to give with the right attitude, with the right spirit. He, God, it says, again, that God loves a cheerful giver. And so it's important for us to check on this. Remember, it, the, the what is important, but also the why. Am I, am I doing it out of obligation or am I doing it cheerfully? The, the why is important and also the how. And again, not so that we just mindfully, mechanic, or mindlessly, or, or mechanically go through the motions, uh, comply with, with, with rules and regs, follow protocol. No, it's... It's all part of a, a healthy 
and quite honestly, a rewarding relationship with God. So with that, I, I, I want to share with you uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. It says here in, in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Key phrase, I'm going to bring it up throughout the message today. If you have one takeaway today, let it be that phrase right there, in view of God's mercy. This is the why, quite honestly. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. In other words, if, if your gift is sharing God's word, then then do so accordance in, in, in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If, if it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently, Paul says. And finally, he says, if it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. And again, as I mentioned right there, right off the bat, in verse 1, Paul gives us the why, right? He, he says, in view of God's mercy, this, therein lies the question, that each and every one of us should ask, why? What's my, what's my view, my point of view? What's my perspective? What, what fuels me? What, what energizes me? What motivates me? And, and what Paul is saying here is that the answer, the best possible thing to be your fuel and your motivation in life is God's mercy. Now, we're going to come back to God's mercy in just a second, but just mercy in general, the Google definition is to show compassion or forgiveness for someone when it is within one's power to punish. Okay, and maybe, you know, it may not even have to involve punishment, but you, you get the idea, right? It's, it's to show compassion or forgiveness when a person has a right, maybe is justified, to react differently. So, for example, if you get pulled over for speeding or for some other traffic violation and the, and the police officer gives you a warning instead of a ticket, that's, that, that would be an act of mercy. Now, I've, I don't know what that's like. I don't, I've never gotten a warning. I've only gotten tickets, okay? <laughs> it's been a few years, but I've never got a warning. I've only gotten tickets. But that's an example of mercy, right? The police officer says, you know, I'm going to let you off the warning this time. You're like, wow, thank you. You know, there's, there's a big sigh of relief, even over something that is, yeah, there's a financial implication uh, with the ticket and your insurance, perhaps, and whatever. But that's not, it's not the biggest thing in the world, and yet it feels really good, right? It's great to be on the receiving end of, of mercy, a bit more, I think, intense of an example would be if the judge, you or, or someone has been, has been convicted of a crime and the judge gives a lighter sentence or maybe no sentence at all. Or, or what, about, what about, as an example of an act of mercy, family members show up at the sentencing of the person who, who brought tragedy into their lives. And instead of holding a grudge, instead of looking that person square in the eye with so much rage and so much anger and saying, I'll never, we'll never forgive you for what you did, for, for how you destroyed our family. They go there and, 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 and they ask the judge for leniency on that person who turned their lives upside down. Or, or, or what if you were that person? And, and, and let's just say, you know, it was, it was a complete accident. It was a horrible, horrible, unintentional, it wasn't malicious. You didn't mean to. There was no fourth. It just, as, as life goes, it just, something happened. 
and, and you brought tragedy into someone's life. Not maliciously, not intentionally, but it happened. And sometimes these things have legal implications, and yet the judge chooses not to sentence you. Maybe even the DA never it chooses not to, not to charge you. But most importantly, the family members affected by all of this. Again, instead of coming to you with so much anger, so much rage, seeking the, the, the most severe penalty, telling you that, 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 they, that they hope you never forget what you've done, Instead, they come to you with a tear in their eye and give you just a warm embrace and say, we forgive you. You know, it really is powerful being on the receiving end of mercy. You know, you are on the receiving end of God's mercy. God's mercy is defined as this. Similar to just the world's idea of mercy. God's mercy, biblical mercy, is that God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Even though, as it says in Romans 7, even though nothing good dwells or lives in me that is in my sinful nature. And one might say, okay, nothing good lives in me. Okay, I can handle that. But nothing bad lives in me either, right? Wrong. Nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Paul takes it another step further in Romans chapter 8, verse 7. He says the sinful mind, again, by nature, the sinful mind is hostile to God. The Bible describes the the sinful flesh, the, 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 the sinful natural mind and heart as being deceitful, as being stubborn, as being hardened toward God. As, as being inclined toward evil all the time, even though all these things are true and important for us to, to, to be mindful of. Yet, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, even though he's in the, in the position to do so. And he's justified in doing so, in, in, in declaring not guilty, in saying, you know what, it says, I, in my own word, it says the wage of sin is death, and you're going to have to, you're going to have to endure that death for eternity. Instead of that, he is compassionate and gracious. Instead of that, you have been washed clean. You were sanctified, made, and that means to be made holy. You were justified. And what that word means is to be declared not guilty. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And and not only in the name of Jesus, but at the expense of Jesus. As he was treated as my sins and your sins deserve. And so what Paul is saying here in this lesson, he's saying don't forget what the Lord has done for you. Do not forget what the Lord has done for you. And and don't forget what it means for you. The full and free forgiveness of all of your sins and an an eternity in the paradise of heaven. Paul is saying, live every day in view of God's mercy. Let it fill you up. Let it fuel your life. Let it, every aspect of your day, let it motivate your heart And let it guide and direct your actions, your thoughts, your words, all your movements every single day. That's the why, right? In view of God's mercy and how powerful and wonderful it is to be on the receiving end of God's mercy. Then Paul gets into the what. Okay, so the why is God's mercy. Here's the what. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So worship is commonly understood as something that we do now virtually, 
but uh, when things are relatively normal, if there is such a thing, it, it happens at a certain time and in a certain place with a certain group of people. Of course, guests are always, always welcome, but we expect to see a lot of the same people every week because we, we have a, a family here known as, as a Gethsemane Lutheran Church. And so worship is commonly understood or oftentimes just kind of pigeonholed into that one hour on Sunday mornings at a certain location. This is the designated time for honoring God with our hearts, with our voices, with our prayers and with our praises, okay? What Paul is saying here is, is that worship is more than just a calendar event. It's more than just this time dedicated in, in, in a dedicated place with certain individuals to honor God with our hearts and with our voices, with our very lives. He, he's saying no. It, it, yeah, or, yes, it's that, but no, it's not only that. It's not restricted to that. It's not exclusively that. Paul is saying, offer your bodies, your whole lives, as a living sacrifice. It is, it is a lifestyle, it's an attitude of the heart that we carry with us all the time. And, and, and you should know that this, is, this can be difficult and it, you can expect it to be painful because to do this, to have this attitude where I'm, in view of God's mercy, I'm offering my body as a living sacrifice. To do that is... Is, is so difficult because it's two things. It's counterintuitive and it's countercultural. It's, it's counterintuitive. In other words, it's, it goes against how my natural sinful mind works or how any and every natural sinful mind works. And it's also countercultural as it goes against the pattern of this world, which Paul talks about in verse 2 of our lesson. It, here he says, he writes, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the, 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 the pattern of this world, the, the sinful mind, say, don't offer something without the guarantee of getting something in return. Right? The, the, the pattern of this world, the sinful mind, say, uh, don't serve unless it also in some way serves your interests. The sinful mind, the pattern of this world that he talks about here, um, would say, don't sacrifice unless in the end, you're going to come out better in some way. Th that's how the sinful nature works. It's the pattern of the sinful world, which is what? It's, it's really selfish and, and certainly reflects an attitude of, an, of entitlement. So what do we do with selfishness? What do we do with entitlement? How do we address those things? Well, one of the best ways, not the only way, I'm sure, but one of the best ways to address selfishness and entitlement is gratitude. Again, as I've said, this is the key phrase. In view of God's mercy, when you, in view of God's mercy, when you reflect on what God has done for you and you reflect on what that means for you, the implications it has for you and your life here and now and in the future, your eternal future, when you reflect on these things, when you realize how generously, how selflessly, how sacrificially you have been served by God, the result is a heart that is grateful. I mean, it, it, it just is. When you, when you reflect on these things and realize these things, it's a heart, results in a heart that is grateful, a heart that has changed, a heart that, as the word Paul uses here, is transformed. A heart that is transformed from the pattern of this world to, again, as Paul says here, God's good and pleasing and perfect will. A heart that is transformed from what's in it for me. How can I come out ahead in all of this? to how can, I, how can I serve just as I myself have been served by God and, and by others? That is, that's, that's the, the what, right? The why in view of God's mercy, the what, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And then, then we're gonna, the, finally we're going to talk about the, the how in, in verses 3 through 5 of Romans chapter 12 here. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. So 
a how in this section most certainly is one of humility, which we're not going to dive into here today. That's a, another message for another time. Uh, what we want to look at here, though, is um, the, the, the body here, that, that the, the picture of a body that the Apostle Paul paints for us here. He goes on to say, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and each of these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. There you go. Sorry about that. Uh, we, though, though, uh, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So the human body is, is wonderfully cre- uh, designed. It, it's a beautifully function, functioning creation of God. And, and each body part is different. Each party, body part is unique. Each body part has a purpose. Each body part plays a role. Each body part has something to offer. Paul says that's, that's what a, a family of believers is like. In fact, you could even extend as the, the context here is a group of believers, a family of Christians. You could make the argument that we, the, the same is true of society, that we all have, uh, we're all part of society and we all have something to offer really is what Paul is saying. As individual human beings, we're all unique, right? As individual human beings, we're all wired differently. We're, we're all uh, differently created and gifted as as. Individual human beings, each and every one of us has gifts. We all have something to offer. And God wants us to use those gifts. He wants us to use our minds and our bodies as he has gifted them to serve others. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, each of you, or you might even say every one of you, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards. In other words, being uh, 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 faithfully managing what God has given to you as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. But again, how? Practically speaking, what does that look like? How can we be uh, active members of a collaborative, supportive group? I have three suggestions, and I th- I, um, if you think about these three things here, you, you're, you're in a good place. Again, in view of God's mercy, always remembering the why. I am an object of God's mercy. Wow, that's amazing. Praise and thank God. Now, how can I, how can I serve as I have been served? And first of all, I would say, be a committed student of God's word. Be a committed student of God's word. That's where, that's where motivation comes from. Again, in view of God's mercy. That's where uh, we learn, again, what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. So that, there's the why and there's also the how. The why is God's mercy. The how is, is um, how does God want me to serve others? Another passage here in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, says that we are to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to grow in grace is to, is to grow in our motivation and to grow in knowledge is to grow in how uh, God wants us to live and to happily carry that out. So first of all, be a committed student of God's word. Be, and then be committed to each other relationally, whether in lockdown or, or back here in person. Be committed to each other relationally. Check in on each other. Check in on one another. Call, text, email, whatever it is. Check in. How are you doing? I heard that X, Y, and Z happened in your life. How are you handling that? How can I support you? What can I do for you? And allow yourself also to be encouraged and to be built up and to be served and supported by others. It's all part of a healthy family of believers. And then the last thing I would, I would add here then is, as we've already talked about some, look for opportunities and to use your gifts to serve, right? To offer your body to use Paul's words here, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Ask yourself, what, what are my spiritual gifts? And Paul lists off some examples in the reading for today, Romans 12, verses 6 and following. What are, uh, what are my spiritual gifts? What am I passionate about? What do I enjoy doing? What life experiences have I had that I can now take and, 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 and use to support someone else because I've already been through that experience? Whatever it is, use your God-given gifts. Use the unique person that he made you to be to offer and to serve, to sacrifice, and to contribute as as he gives you opportunity 
to do so always and again in view of God's mercy and what he has done for you. And it truly is rewarding. Right? It, it, it is rewarding and it is a blessing to be a blessing to others. It's rewarding, it, it's a blessing to put a smile on someone's face, to, to meet another person's need, to, to be there for someone, to help someone out. It, it's, it's rewarding and it's a blessing to know that you are part of something bigger, that you are an instrument in the hand of our gracious and powerful God here on this earth to be a blessing to so many people in your life. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your mercy, for not treating us as our sins deserve, but instead, uh, you, you're compassionate, you're gracious, you sent your son, Jesus, to live perfectly in our place and to die on a cross, and he shed his blood. He, he was treated as our sins deserve. Thank you, Lord, for, for your grace and this, this incredibly generous and selfless sacrifice uh, so that we can have the confidence that even though the wages of sin is death, we know that the gift of God, your free gift to us, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now help us to be motivated by your mercy and your grace and your generosity and your sacrifice to us to, to then take what you've given to us and to look for ways to, to serve you by serving here on this earth. Uh, help us to honor you with our hearts and with our voices, uh, not just when we gather for worship, but throughout the week at all times. Help us to be committed students of your word where we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to be loving and, and supportive uh, of others, to build each other up and to encourage one another as committed members of a body of believers. And, and help us to take those gifts that you have given us and again, to use them to your glory and for the benefit of, of sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus here on this earth. Uh, we pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.